This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, Australia will purchase nuclear powered attack submarines from the U.S. That's amid growing concerns over China's influence in the Indo Pacific region. Fallout and after effects from the recent bank failures, and the Fed investigates the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank to find out why regulators didn't see it coming. A controversial oil drilling project in Alaska is now approved. The Biden administration gives the green light for a scaled back version of the project. What does it mean for the future of America's energy supply? In some languages, seafood is called a gift from the sea. Those gifts are on full display at North America's largest seafood exhibition in Boston. We take you there. And an art form from the 17th century involving books and vanishing images takes a man on a magical journey, even meeting the Queen of England. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Tuesday, March 14th. And Australia has reached an agreement to buy nuclear-powered submarines from the U.S. It's part of a plan involving the United States, Australia and Britain. Here are the details. The leaders of the U.S., the U.K. and Australia met in San Diego on Monday for talks on national security. The three countries formed a security pact known as AUKUS in 2021. Its goal is to counter the threat of the Chinese regime in the Indo-Pacific region. Today, we're announcing the steps to carry out our first project under AUKUS and developing Australia's conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarine capacity. Under the agreement, Australia is able to access U.S. nuclear-powered submarine technology. Nuclear submarines are stealthier and more capable than conventionally powered ones. Australia will buy up to five Virginia-class nuclear submarines from the U.S. They are worth around $3 billion each. The AUKUS agreement we confirm here in San Diego represents the biggest single investment in Australia's defence capability in all of our history, strengthening Australia's national security and stability in our region. The UK and Australia will also build new nuclear-powered submarines from a British design, with US technology and support. The first submarines are expected to be completed by the late 2030s. The submarines will carry conventional, non-nuclear weapons. AUKUS has one overriding objective, to enhance the stability of the Indo-Pacific amid rapidly shifting global dynamics. In this first project, this first project is only beginning. More partnerships, more potential, more peace and security in the region lies ahead. During the meeting, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also pledged to boost the domestic defence budget. He said the UK will, for the first time, move the baseline commitment from 2% of the GDP to 2.5% of the GDP. That means over $6 billion in the next two years. This is how Sunak assesses the threats that AUKUS faces. But more broadly about China, I think it's just clear that it represents a systemic challenge to us and the world order. It's a country with fundamentally different values to ours, and its behavior over the past few years has been concerning. More authoritarian at home, more assertive overseas. The three leaders said in a joint statement that their countries have worked for decades to sustain peace, stability, and prosperity around the globe. And they say that Monday's deal will help them advance these goals. The Biden administration is striking a different tone on fossil fuel policy. On Monday, the White House announced it's greenlighting a scaled-back version of a controversial oil drilling project in Alaska. Here's NTD's Melina Wisecup with more details. Soon, there will be more oil flowing from Alaska's North Slope, an oil drilling project that's been in limbo since it was leased decades ago, now on track to produce around 180,000 barrels a day. Well, it's a huge day for Alaska, Molina. What, what it does is it gives Alaska a, 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 another gigantic oil field to tap and produce oil and gas for the, uh, for the country. I, I can't say it was fully expected, but it's welcomed by the, the vast, vast majority of the people here in Alaska. 
The project quickly garnered praise from both sides of the aisle. Both Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski and newly elected Democrat Congresswoman Mary Poltola saying the project will generate revenues and create jobs. And some say the project is good news for the neighboring state of California. But a lot of that oil ends up getting refined in California. What those, those Alaska barrels do is they replace Saudi oil that is coming uh, via ship into California. In recent weeks, the Biden administration striking a different tone on oil and gas. So we're going to need oil for at least another decade. Biden's teetering on a narrow line as he still tries to keep his grip on his progressive base. The Willow Project is scaled back from five drilling pads to just three. Still, climate activists slam it as a lack of climate leadership and accuse Biden of handing over an intact ecosystem to ConocoPhillips. Messaging like this emerging as popular on social media, notably on the Chinese-owned app TikTok. Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan last week telling reporters. Has had over 300 million views relating to stopping this project. Maybe that's the Chinese Communist Party trying to influence young Americans. Climate groups will likely launch court challenges to stop the project. But if all stays on track, oil could be flowing down the Trans-Alaska pipeline in three to four years. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Next, we're taking a look at the after effects of the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank collapses. Bank stocks tumbled yesterday on worries about what's next to break. Investors are on high alert for banks with similar issues. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the fallout from the second and third largest bank failures in U.S. history. Banks below those deemed too big to fail saw enormous pressure on Monday. Shares of First Republic Bank took a nosedive, dropping 60 percent in pre-market trading. PacWest tumbled 35 percent in the pre-market session. Western Alliance had their shares plummet by over 80 percent, their largest one-day drop ever. They climbed a bit during the day to close down 47 percent. Charles Schwab's stock fell 23 percent during Monday's trading session, but regained some ground, closing down 11 percent. That's despite the bank's assurances of being in healthy conditions. Shares of other regional banks and financial firms are also stumbling, signaling continued unease despite the aggressive federal response announced Sunday to protect depositors. FDIC employees assured concerned customers lined up outside of Silicon Valley Bank headquarters in California that their money was safe. Feel free to transact business as usual. It's just a little, we asked for a little bit of time because of the bond. But many clients weren't taking any chances. We're here to uh, see if we can extract the money uh, quickly. No, I'm going to clear it out and uh, learn my lesson and we're not going to put the money all in one uh, place. According to the Mortgage News Daily, 30-year fixed mortgage rates dropped to just under 6.6% on Monday. The housing market could see more buyers if the trend continues. The rates are influenced by the 10-year Treasury yield, which has dropped due to the recent bank failures. U.S. inflation data due late Tuesday could inject more market volatility, even if investors see the Fed prioritizing financial stability. The Federal Reserve is investigating Silicon Valley Bank to find out how regulators, including some feds, missed the financial storm. Their review is set to be publicly released on May 1st. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. President Biden addressed the banking crisis yesterday. He assured Americans that the U.S. banking system is safe. He says he's going to ask Congress and regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to lessen the chances of it happening again. Biden says investors will not be protected because they took a risk, and that's how capitalism works. The president also says all management of the failed banks will be fired. Now Bill Ackman, a billionaire investor, is saying the government did the right thing in intervening to protect depositors' funds. He says it's not a bailout. I wanted to learn more about a big concern that's brewing over the collapse, so I spoke with an expert. Have a listen. Joining us for some discussion is Joseph Trevisani, who is a senior analyst at FX Street. It's great to have you with us today, Joseph. Good morning. Nice to be here. President Biden is insisting the financial system is safe after both Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank failed. That was after the FDIC expanded its coverage so depositors wouldn't lose any money. Is there any indication that the country will experience a banking panic? I don't think so, because I think the limits to the types of banks that have these problems is much more uh, subscribe, um, much more circumscribed than it was in 2008. In other words, there were many more banks in 2008 that had much greater problems. 
Right now, the problem is limited to the banks that see that have confidence problem, meaning that their depositors are worried because of their exposure that they need to get their money out. Now, the Fed has taken some weight off that by agreeing to backstop both um, SVB and Signature so that nobody loses any money. That should prevent any widespread problems with bank runs. Yes, protecting depositors is very important in terms of the common people here. But now SVP's depositors were faced with challenges in the economy, and so they made big withdrawals that were uncommon. And the bank faced difficulties because the value of their bond assets dropped because interest rates went up. Do you expect other banks will face a similar situation? I do. And the biggest problem is not so much that they face the situation. After all, rising interest rates in an economy is not exactly an unusual situation. And not only that, this is not sprung yesterday on the economy. The Fed has been raising rates for a year. There's no mystery about this. Everybody knows what's going on and everybody knows what happens to the value of fixed income assets when rates go up. So it seems more that SVB and others may not have managed their exposure very well rather than actually being at fault for having the exposure to begin with. Yes, that's definitely something these bankers can see coming. Now, after SBP collapsed, Bernie Merkis, the, CEO, the co-founder of Home Depot, said it's time for Americans to, quote unquote, wake up to the concept that the U.S. economy is in tough times. What's your stance on this? And is the fate of one bank enough to support such a claim? Well, I think it depends on the sector. I mean, certainly if you look at the uh, tech sector, which has benefited from very low rates and lots of expansion, but that's expansion based on debt. It's, it's expansion of startups. That is the riskiest type of economic endeavor for a company. So those sectors, yes, have real problems. I don't think that you're going to see it across the entire country just yet or across the entire economy. It hasn't moved that far. It is right now in the risky sectors, and that is certainly the tech sector. Very in-depth analysis. Joseph Trevisani, senior analyst at FX Street, really do appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. West Virginia wants to ban gender reassignment procedures on minors. The Republican majority legislature passed a bill on March 10th to that effect. House Bill 2007 passed the Senate in a 30 to 2 vote. Under the bill, health care providers in the state will be barred from providing irreversible gender reassignment surgery to a person under 18. The ban also applies to puberty blockers. However, the bill contains certain exceptions. It would allow procedures on those born with a medically verifiable sex development disorder. Further exemptions were added for people under the age of 18 at risk of suicide. Republican Governor Jim Justice has not yet indicated if he will sign the bill into law. The American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association have all voiced support for gender transition procedures among minors. The U.S. government sued Rite Aid yesterday. It accuses the pharmacy chain of missing red flags as it filled hundreds of thousands of prescriptions for controlled substances, including opioids. The Department of Justice says Rite Aid repeatedly filled prescriptions from May 2014 to June 2019 that were medically unnecessary. Rite Aid pharmacists were accused of ignoring obvious signs of misuse, including in prescriptions for Trinities. Those refer to a combination of opioids, tranquilizers, and muscle relaxers preferred by drug abusers for their increased euphoric effect. The Justice Department also said Rite Aid intentionally deleted some pharmacists' internal warnings about suspicious prescribers, and it joined a whistleblower lawsuit filed in 2019 by two pharmacists and a pharmacy technician from Rite Aid stores. And just ahead, a steady stream of illegal immigrants is crossing into Canada from the U.S., Hear what officials have to say about it. Crabs, oysters, lobsters, seafood lovers find heaven on earth in Boston at North America's largest seafood exposition. Stay tuned for more after the break. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Shen Yun, coming to Lincoln Center, April 6th to the 16th. 
Buy tickets now at ShenYu.com. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. I am blind, but I need not see. Mm -hmm. I know this road is there for me. If I'm real. Welcome back. Illegal immigrants entering the U.S. have now set their sight on a new destination, Canada. In January alone, crossings neared 5,000 at the U.S.-Canada border. On a lonely frozen stretch of upstate New York, a dead end. This is where the U.S. and Canada meet at a makeshift unauthorized crossing known as Roxham Road. Anyone who treks across the border here into Quebec is told by Canadian authorities they will be immediately arrested. I have to advise you it's illegal to enter Canada here. Right now you're under arrest for crossing the border of Canada. It's illegal to enter Canada here. If you do so, you will be placed under arrest by the police. But every day, a seemingly endless stream of asylum seekers intent on trying to find safe haven in yet another country cross the line anyway. Come right in there. I'll take your bag. Warnings are everywhere on this road in Champlain, New York, but they don't deter the stream of people, many of whom have cobbled together a way to get to Manhattan, then take a bus to a town 28 miles south of here, and then pay a driver to drop them off at this tiny corridor. They're unaware of what lies ahead and the cold they'll face along the way. These last few years have seen an influx in crossings that Canada is not prepared to handle. Simply securing appointments to obtain a work authorization can now take months or longer. This individual crossed in February and you're seeing that their date's actually February 11th, 2025. So two years. About an hour north of the border. Over here also. Abdullah Daoud helps lead the refugee center in Montreal. So these numbers are a dramatic increase from the numbers that we're used to seeing uh, historically in Canada. The nonprofit working with the Canadian government to help guide refugees through the asylum process. December saw an increase from November. January saw an increase from December. February saw an increase from January. Canadian government figures show a record 39,000 unauthorized entries into Quebec from the U.S. in 2022. Nearly all, according to experts, entered through Roxham Road. In January alone, crossings here neared 5,000. Compare that to just more than 2,300 a year before. U.S. and Canadian officials are discussing potential changes to the Safe Third Country Agreement. A loophole in that treaty is incentivizing migrants crossing from the U.S. to use Roxham Road. Today is the final day of North America's largest seafood exposition in Boston. Seafood professionals from around the world have transformed the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center into a dynamic seafood marketplace. And today's Daniel Monahan brings us more. Seafood Expo North America attracts thousands of buyers and suppliers from around the world. They attend the annual three-day exhibition to meet, network, and do business. This year's exhibit space spans nearly 240,000 net square feet. About 1,200 exhibiting companies from 49 countries are taking part. Visitors can sample lots of yummy items like this island mahi-mahi chowder or wild Alaskan pollock. The space is loaded up with all kinds of seafood products including fish, oysters, lobsters and crabs. Sushi company sales manager Song Jie says sushi is a category that does very well to go. And the events of the last few years helped the company gather more market share. Song says they source their seafood products from all over the world. Well, we, like you mentioned, we source from China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Philippines, Iceland, Netherlands, Canada, and also domestically from, uh, domestically from USA. They sell to customers in the U.S., South America, and the Caribbean, and are exploring future exports to Europe. Yes, yes, sushi is becoming very, very popular, and you know, especially Asian food. And with the sushi now, cookie with the Hawaiian theme is becoming also very popular. Song says salmon, yellowtail, and tuna are sushi customer favorites. But we're also noticing like uh, items like octopus, as well as uh, unagi, which is uh, eel. Uh, and also like shellfish items are becoming very, very popular. 
Per Olav Mevold, manager of a Norwegian salmon company, says business is very good. The problem is that uh, we have a very high price level on the salmon at the moment because the world cannot increase the production. So demand is increasing and production is stable on a certain level. While oyster farm manager Jacob McMillan says this year's growing season was strong. As for pricing, he believes it will follow trends but won't grow as drastically as other products have. The exhibit hall is packed with seafood and processing companies offering a variety of fresh, frozen, canned and packaged seafood products and showcases market-leading processing and packaging equipment. The expo welcomes new pavilions representing Australia, Denmark, Papua New Guinea and Singapore. Exhibitors from China are also back with a notable presence after a hiatus brought on by pandemic travel restrictions. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. From fruit tarts to eclairs, from artistic cakes to macaroons, everyone has their favorite place to go for their sweet tooth, but one bakery in California has been named the best in town. NTD's Jackie Rios met the owners. If you got a sweet tooth, Artelis Patisserie is the place to visit. It's been named the best pastry shop in the Golden State by Yelp. Let's meet the owners of this place. So in Iran, uh, because of the situation, uh, there is like um, some limitations of um, ingredients. We thought it's best to move somewhere that we can just have no limits of as far as, you know, um, getting the right ingredients. The brothers left behind the careers they knew. For his brother Farik, it was industrial engineering, and for Saeed, it was mechanical engineering. They became pastry owners in Iran in 2011. But due to the situation in Iran, the brothers had trouble getting quality ingredients and trying to expand. One of the key things about these uh, pastries is uh, sourcing good quality ingredients. For example, we source our chocolates from France. Um, the fruit purees that we use is from France. The butter is from France. So in 2017, they decided to leave Iran and start anew in the United States, opening the first pastry shop in West Los Angeles. Like any new business, it takes time to be successful. But because the shop was chosen to make desserts for the Grammys, it received a lot of exposure and stayed afloat during the pandemic lockdowns. Customers say they love the taste of these delicious pastries. The pastries are as close as you know, international food that we can get. So whenever we want, you know, a, an event or a gathering with friends uh, and we want to include a nice dessert at the end, we come here. Oh my gosh, the Napoleon's really good. Any of the croissants, the mango croissant is really good. Oh my gosh, it's to die for. Um, yeah, uh, oh, the macarons for sure. <laughs> I've been trying a bunch of different places around LA and that's the best i found so far and I'm pretty picky with pastries so um, yeah it's definitely even better than some places I know from France so I'm really glad it's here. The brothers also work with event planners for parties to serve delicious pastries. Jackie Reels, NTD News, West Los Angeles, California. Coming up after the break, we take a look at a unique form of vanishing art. It's called four-edge painting and goes back to the 17th century. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. The Fixture Pioneer, CGM. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All round integration of four systems. High precision. High durability, high quality, two micrometer repetition accuracy, more than 80 patent certificates, ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Welcome back. 
Books have taken mankind on magical journeys for hundreds of years, but that magic isn't always limited to the tales they hold within. Meet Martin Frost. Some would say he's a wizard of sorts. His particular brand of alchemy, making images on book edges appear. Shakespeare. It's got gilded edges. A bit unusual for books. Not unusual for old books. But that gilded edge... hides a painting. The paint is actually on the face of each page, but the tip of each leaf is gilded, concealing the image. So I've shown you how the magic's done there. It's very simple, but it's very effective. Uh, this has been wowing people for hundreds of years. The earliest versions of forage painting, as it's called, hail from England in the mid-17th century. Gold is the material traditionally used, but other materials like foil also work. Martin has always been around art, his father a professional portrait painter, his mom an art shop manager, and he's painted most of his life. Does he still enjoy it? Isn't it obvious I'm enjoying this job? <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't do it for 40 to 43 years otherwise. Um, it's, I love painting. I've always been a painter. And what's, what is heaven for a painter besides painting? The artist has even been awarded a distinguished prize for keeping the old British book art chugging on. He expected to receive the award from Prince Charles, but when he arrived at Windsor Castle, he was met by the Queen of England herself. So I went up to, um, uh, up to Windsor Castle and um, uh, I was one of the last people to be presented with an award before we lost her, which was not that long ago now. So I'm, I, I feel honoured for that. Privileged, privileged. Martin is the last in Britain still working in the craft and has been listed as a critically endangered craftsman by Heritage Crafts Association. The problem is with forage painting, nobody sees them because of their very nature. They're hidden inside a book. You can't hang the painting on the wall and the only way you can see it is to have somebody find it out. So it's little wonder that it's not known even so, Martin says there has been a marked increase in people doing something similar called edge painting in the last five years. And he says social media has also helped to get the word out. I'm here with my loudspeaker telling everybody about it. Martin says handcrafted goods like forage painting are special, holding a bit of the craftsman in them. He hopes it's something people continue to support into the future. As for himself, he plans to keep on painting for as long as he can. Wow, looks incredible. And he's the last working forage painter in the world. I really hope he passes on to somebody. Oh, yeah, and he doesn't just do the painting either. He does the book gilding, the page gilding, and the book binding as well. Amazing. Well, let's hope that craft makes a comeback. Yes. We're going to make a comeback tomorrow because that's it for today, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your stories in particular. If you have any, you can share them at goodmorning at ntd.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.